If you find the truth I depict here offensive, then, wretched reader, you recognise your own self. There are few philosophers in history as notorious as the Marquis de Sade, the man who wrote endless disturbing erotica while imprisoned in the Bastille, who rebelled against the very notion of morality, and whose infamy gives us the word sadistic. He is often overlooked on philosophy courses for understandable reasons. Who would want to read these books written by a depraved madman? And yet we evade the thinking of Sade at our peril, for contained within his works is a devilish skewering of our common conceptions of love that is, despite it all, worth listening to. Whereas many philosophers and authors before him have painted love as something ennobling, something that brings out the best in mankind, and something that promotes selflessness and virtue, Sade sees love just as often bringing out the worst of human impulses. He sees it as a hungry emotion, full of desire and strong enough to overcome even the strictest of moral boundaries. And he explores these ideas thoroughly in his collection of short stories entitled The Crimes of Love. Get ready to learn how love can turn ordinary people to committing atrocities, how scorned affection can unleash monsters, and how we should all perhaps be a bit more sceptical of this quintessentially good emotion. Now, more than in any other video, I encourage you to take Saad's ideas with a pinch of salt. He is not for the faint-hearted, and if you're not careful, he can lead you into mindless cynicism. But there is nonetheless wisdom to be gained from his unique and slightly twisted perspective. Just, you know, don't swallow it whole. Oh, and if you're watching this on release, I hope you had a pleasant Valentine's Day. Maybe don't show this one to your date. But without further ado, let's begin our exploration of the warped world of the Marquis de Sade. One the dangers of virtuous love. We often like to imagine that true love is something that really only happens between virtuous people. The great Greek philosopher Aristotle thought as much, and said that anything else would only be a partnership of pleasure or utility, with each party using the other for their own ends. We see these ideas in our own culture today. We like to think that good people will find other good people to partner with, and that they will enjoy happy lives together, each of the lovers made kinder and better by the presence of the other. But Saad spits upon this image. He views it as naive to the point of childishness, and highlights what he sees as the harsh reality of so-called virtuous love in his stories. In so many of his tales, the virtues of the innocent lovers make them far too trusting, and thus they easily fall prey to the designs of powerful libertine foes, who wish to rob the lovers of their happiness in service to their own base desires. In one particularly disturbing tale, a kind young woman named Henrietta is devoted to her love a man called Williams, when she becomes the object of the hedonistic Lord Granwell's desire. Granwell immediately schemes to undermine the pair. He bankrupts Williams and eventually lures both he and Henrietta to his castle, where he intends to murder Williams and force Henrietta against her will to become his bride. And this final ploy only succeeds because Henrietta blindly trusts Granwell at the first sign of his pretended repentance. To lure Henrietta to him, Granwell falls at her feet and apologises, saying that he will personally see to it that she and Williams are married at once. In her virtue, Henrietta immediately believes that his remorse is genuine. It doesn't seem to cross her mind that this might be a further trick. And she says, I no longer remember the injuries done to me by anyone who takes a single step to obtain my forgiveness. For Saad, it is the fact that Henrietta is a genuinely good person that causes her downfall, because her saint-like willingness to forgive is the very thing that Lord Granwell takes advantage of. If she were not so kind, so generous, so trusting, then she would not have travelled to his castle. She would have realised that it was all a ruse by Granwell to murder her lover and take her by force as his wife. And Henrietta only snatches victory from the jaws of defeat by abandoning her innocent ways, killing herself and Granwell in a murder-suicide. And Saad sends a clear message here that is consistent with his wider philosophy. Since Plato, it has largely been argued by the most famous philosophers in history that to be virtuous was not only the correct thing to do, but that it would also bring you fulfilment in the long term. From Aristotle to the Stoics to Dostoevsky, the same message is uttered. Cruel and selfish ways may grant someone short-term pleasure, but it will never give anything close to the happiness and fulfilment that true virtue would bring. But Saad simply gestures at the world and says, there's no evidence that this is true. Throughout his life, he constantly saw people who were willing to abandon virtue defeat anyone who clung to some idea of goodness or principle. Saad lived through the terror of Robespierre, 
He was imprisoned by his own relatives. He ended his life locked up in a lunatic asylum. He had no reason to believe that the world was fair or just or that goodness would prevail over evil. And in his view, nor should it. For him, morality is just a superstitious means of making people stupid and unfulfilled. At points, he almost seems like a more spiteful and extreme version of Nietzsche. And this is his first cynical pronouncement. Abandon virtue in love and in life. In his view, people are mostly out for themselves. And unlike Nietzsche, he does not recognise that the powerful might have genuinely benevolent desires or love for their fellow man. Saad seems to think that all virtue is doing is taking off your armour in the heat of battle, trusting that your enemy is good enough not to stab you when you're at your most vulnerable. Of course, most of us would not want to absorb this message in its entirety. It is perhaps the most cynical view on human nature that I have yet come across. Thomas Hobbes has got nothing on this. But there is some wisdom in his spite. The idea that goodness by itself will bring happiness must not go unchallenged. As Machiavelli often alluded to, virtue without power is just asking to be topped by a more ruthless and unscrupulous foe. The idea that we can always follow the moral line, assuming that everyone else is doing the same, and that everything will somehow turn out for the best, does seem a little bit idealistic. And no one provides a better counterpoint to this classic philosophical idea than the Marquis de Sade. But the next supposed myth of love that Sade attacks is the idea that it will somehow make you more noble. And this is just what we shall move on to next. If you want to help me make more videos like this, then consider subscribing to either my email list or my Patreon. The links are in the description. 2. The Corruptions of Love it is commonly said that love brings out the best in people. This idea has echoed from the medieval notion of courtly love all the way through to the rom-coms of today. Love ennobles us. It makes us happier. It makes us saner. It fills us with purely selfless intentions and helps us become better people. But again, Saad thinks this is a happy delusion. In his view, love is much like any strong or passionate desire. Sure, it has the potential to do good, whatever you take that to mean, but it also has great potential for evil, for destruction and for selfishness. It is a vigorous yet amoral force that propels someone to possess the object of their affections, whatever the cost. This is most evident in the story of the Countess of Sancerre. This tale focuses on the titular countess, her daughter Amelie, and her daughter's betrothed, a dashing young noble named Mon Ravel. By all accounts, there is no dispute between the countess and her daughter apart from one. The countess also loves Mon Ravel. When her husband dies, the countess is eaten up with the desire to take Mon Ravel for herself. And this slowly makes her hate her own daughter. In Saad's view, she becomes capable of all the crimes to which passion may lead. The fierce love she holds for Mon Ravel drives her to all manner of awful actions. She first attempts to seduce him, despite the immense upset this would cause Amelie. And when it is clear she cannot possess him, she resolves to have her daughter killed. She tricks Mon Ravel into thinking Amelie is being courted by another potential suitor, and furthermore, that this suitor is trying to have Mon Ravel killed. She tells Mon Ravel that he must strike down this rival. Mon Ravel agrees to this plan, but at the same time, the Countess has arranged for her daughter to be dressed like the rival. And in the confusion, Mon Ravel kills the very woman he loves, after which he turns the knife on himself. Even at the very end, the Countess insists that she did what she did out of love for Mon Ravel. And it was this love that drove her to commit such heinous crimes. And the rest of the tale does support this. After the death of Mon Ravel and Amelie, the Countess spends the rest of her life repenting for this misdeed. In Saad's story, she sincerely changes and becomes a nun, regretting her former actions. It was love that turned this potentially kind and noble woman into a killer. And in illustrating this, Saad points to an often overlooked element that love can bring to the table. By its very nature, love is one of the strongest emotions a person can feel. But with this strength, sometimes comes the willingness to commit almost any transgression provided it gets someone closer to the possession of their love. In Shakespeare, love drives many characters to murder. In Saad, it drives a mother to kill her own daughter. And there are innumerable cases of possessive lovers murdering the very object of their affections. Otherwise ordinary people committing atrocities at the altar of their passion. And deep down, we all know that love has this capability. So why does it go unacknowledged? Well, if you'll indulge me in some baseless speculation, I think it is because we are scared. It is a terrifying prospect to think that normal people, just like us, would be capable of committing grievous crimes, driven on by the irresistible force of an emotion we normally consider so pure. It produces a similar effect to learning that many who committed war crimes during World War II were thought of as perfectly sane, with nothing to distinguish them from the rest of the population. That is, nothing to say that they aren't like us.
It alerts us to the uncomfortable truth that if we were to just feel strongly enough, we too might become monstrous. It points to the devil that lurks inside, and many of us do not like what we see. Especially not the idea that it could be spurred into action by something seemingly so innocent and noble as love. Such seems to be Sard's view, at least. And I do think it's worth asking whether our cultural idea of romance has made us blind to the potential disasters caused by passionate affection. But what Sard thinks people do for love is nothing compared to the effects of romantic rejection. And that is just our next point. 3. The Cruelty of Love Scorned Most of us know how painful rejection can be. It can feel like the entire universe is screaming at us that we are not good enough. It makes it seem like we will never be happy. It burns at our pride and it wounds our egos. And the situation is even worse with romantic rejection. History and literature is littered with people turned bitter and hateful by romantic rejection. Arguably, both Nietzsche and Schopenhauer suffered from this in some way. But few have as great an insight into the potential violence of a scorned lover than the Marquis de Sade. One of his stories follows a Swedish noble named Oxtiern and his attempts to seduce and marry a young woman called Ernestine, who is engaged to her lover, Hermann. He needs to dispose of Hermann, and so he recruits a widow named Schultz, who is in love with Hermann, but Hermann has spurned her advances. And this widow immediately decides that if she can't have him, then no one can. She frames Hermann as a thief and says that he will be arrested and executed if he does not agree to marry her. And when he insists that his heart belongs to Ernestine and politely refuses her love, she does just that, turning him into the authorities where Oxtiern then arranges for him to be swiftly killed. And this is not the only example of rejected love turning violent in Sard's tales. Arguably the Countess in the story we discussed last section turned bitter partly because of the strength of her passion for Montrevel, but also the loss of her dignity at having been rejected. Worst of all, rejected in favour of another. I have spoken at length on this channel about the notion from Sartre and Lacan that our identities are greatly constructed by how people react to us. If we are brave and people agree, then we happily integrate it into our identity. But if we say we are brave and people disagree, calling us a coward instead, then we will find it very difficult to internalise the idea that we actually have courage. This can be immensely distressing, especially if we hold bravery as something quite dear to our identity. And in a lot of ways, this is what makes romantic rejection so difficult as well. We identify with a potential future where someone else loves us, and then we are rejected by them. It strikes at the very core of what many of us think makes us valuable. We become attached to the image of ourselves that will only be validated if the object of our love loves us back. So when they do not, it is like they've buried a white-hot dagger deep into our hearts, which nothing can dislodge. This partly explains why so much hatred and anger is caused by romantic rejection. The common phrase is, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, but this is hardly limited to one sex. It is not confined to a single gender or creed or culture, but instead rears its head whenever we have tied our identity too closely to romantic success. Especially romantic success with a particular person. Then, in an instant, all of the strength of someone's affections turns to anger and hate at the very concept of their beloved spurning them. But of course, this psychological pain is at least partly based on an illusion. In fact, any one rejection is likely nothing to do with us. It could be that our would-be lover is simply unavailable or distracted by other matters in life. Or, like in Sard's tales, too besotted with someone else to give us the time of day. Such reasons for rejection reflect very little on who we are, and we only intensify our own pain by taking them as a personal attack, rather than what they almost certainly are, a result of factors far outside our immediate control. But Sard's villains bring out both the potential pain of rejection and the awful things a person can do in response to it. Considering how often we see this woeful pattern play out in the real world, perhaps we ought to pay more attention to it. And it is just another ugly side of love that Sard drags kicking and screaming into the light. But there is one notable theme in his tales that we have yet to touch upon, and it helps put all of this into stark perspective. 4. Passion, Love and Scepticism Part of the reason I tend to view Sard as such a cynic about love is because he seems to think that even when love is achieved, it does not properly sustain joy or happiness. Where he paints virtuous or innocent lovers as destined to be undermined or taken advantage of by some powerful figure who cares not for the boundaries of morality, he also portrays those villains themselves as destined for misery. They too will be eaten alive by their passions, despite all their best efforts to fulfil themselves with their own perverse breed of love. And nowhere is this clearer than in the most disturbing tale of the collection, the sorry story of Eugenie de Franval. I will warn you that this story is even less tasteful than the others, so viewer discretion is advised. The narrative centres on Franval, a passionate and villainous noble who weds a kind young woman, and they have a child together, Eugenie. 
And then Franval proceeds to fall in love with his own daughter, grooming her over the course of her childhood. His abuse twists her mind into thinking that she loves him too. From this point, Saad paints Franval as joyful on the surface, but lurking just beneath lies someone tormented by the thought of losing their victim. For the latter part of the story, Franval is racked with fear over the prospect of Eugenie leaving him. Until the very end of the story, it is not moral concerns that torment him, but merely the consequences of his twisted attachment to his own daughter. His warped kind of love eats away at his mind, as he knows it's only a matter of time before the ruse is exposed, and his perverse source of meaning is ripped from him. Saad seems to take pleasure in the tension wrought by this narrative, on the one hand emphasising Fromval's inner torment, and on the other reminding the reader of his crimes, carefully calculated to be not just morally shocking, but emotionally repulsive. But just as the innocent lovers in his previous tales fell victim to some aggressor, Franval is undone by the consequences of his own dastardly deeds. He is forced to be separated from his wife and victim for a while due to an ongoing court case, and he has left orders for Eugenie to murder her own mother. She dutifully obeys, but at that very moment her mind is torn free from Franval's brainwashing, and she returns to reality. Seeing her mother's dead body with her own psyche now restored, she drops down dead unable to go on. When Franval hears of this, he falls on his own sword, realising his villainy has created a world he no longer wishes to live in. And this is where the killing blow of Saad's pessimism strikes. It is not that he is merely cautioning young innocent lovers to not be so naive as to let themselves become the victim of outside forces. He is not just the Machiavelli of romance, warning people about the dangers of powerlessness. He seems to view even the villains of love themselves falling prey to the dangers of passion. For Saad, there seems no way of avoiding potential disaster when romance is in the air. Whether you are the most virtuous soul in France or the cruelest bastard to ever walk the earth, no one is safe from the potential havoc that can accompany love. In some ways, this message is only consistent with his other works. In his lengthy novel, Juliet, which is genuinely quite an unpleasant read, the only characters that obtain a sliver of happiness are those that remain completely unattached to the people around them. Not like a Stoic, valuing virtue above all else, but rather as an extreme nihilist, who rejects the bonds of God or morality or even love, and instead pursues only moment-to-moment -moment hedonistic pleasure. It is a deeply cynical version of what would make a person happy. And perhaps it is only right that Saad has gone down in history as an evil and hate-filled nymphomaniac. But it is genuinely interesting to see what the world looks like through his eyes. It honestly seems like he cannot see the parts of life that other people enjoy. It's like he has a filter, blocking out all but the least pleasant parts of reality. And yet Saad somehow manages to take pleasure in this. Of course, in response to Saad's reckless cynicism, we could say that someone who does all of these things, hurts innocence in the name of their affections, lets their desire turn selfish, reacts violently to rejection, and causes destruction to all parties, is not truly experiencing love, but rather avarice or simple passion. But Saad presents a different and much more disturbing proposition, that love has just as much potential to spark these ugly human tendencies as it does the noble and caring behaviour we associate with true romance. He shows love in a cold and disillusioned light, a powerful amoral force with the potential to bring out both the best and the worst in our fragile psyches, and one that has just as much ability to leave a trail of misery, pain and torment as it does to bring about happily ever after. And though we might not want to agree wholeheartedly, it is worth listening to what this arch cynic of love has to say. If nothing else, it adds a bloody counterpoint to our common sense notion of the inherent goodness of love. Perhaps somewhere between naivety and sard lies a middle ground where our philosophy of love can find its golden mean. And if you want more on literature's greatest monsters, click here to learn about the curious case of John Milton's Satan, and whether he is a noble rebel or the embodiment of evil. And stick around for more on thinking to improve your life.